Uh, welcome to the panel, Blockchain as an Essential Ingredient for Smart Cities of the Future. I'm Andrea Tiniano from Global Delaware. I'm so excited to be here on this panel in Dubai today talking about this subject because Dubai has planted its flag in the ground and um, has, is looking towards the future to become a smart city. And here we have a panel with different backgrounds and areas of expertise. What I would like to do is ask, ask each of them, perhaps starting with Isa, to introduce themselves and then tell us why, offer an insight as to why they believe blockchain is an essentially ingredient to the smart city of the future. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Isa Chini. I'm uh, the strategy officer at my city. Um, uh, what we do, we really engage citizens across the city in a digital manner, as simple as accessing a building across the city, as simple as fast-tracking your experience. But what we notice across two and a half years of uh, working um, in Dubai, that the core problem of all the journeys we have across the city is really the identity. And uh, we came up with, we'll talk a little bit more about the identity, but the, uh, the identity is a dynamic element of our lives. We, we heard it across the, uh, the venues for the last two days. But the core problem of it is that you cannot give me a personalized service if you don't know really who I am as a person. Now, blockchain came, uh, in short, blockchain came and solved the problem of trust, of uh, the sharing of uh, data, uh, of additional security that we will talk about it. And we couldn't have a better ecosystem than Dubai that facilitated that trustless environment where intermediaries are easy to fall down. Thank you so much, Vakas. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Vakas Mirza and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer and Managing Director of Avanza Solutions. Um, we're not exactly a startup, we're a 17 year old company. Uh, and our expertise is in the transaction processing, payment systems, and uh, channel banking solutions. Uh, during the past two years, what we've tried to do is we've tried to bring that knowledge of payment systems and transaction processing systems and customer service and experience systems and port them onto newer technologies such as blockchain and artificial intelligence. Uh, we have an asset called Cypher, which is currently being implemented in Dubai. Uh, it is not a lab project, it's not a POC, it's a full-blown citywide implementation of reconciliation and settlement of government funds. Um, the project uh, goes live. Uh, it went live in December. We're bringing different entities on board uh, gradually. Um, in my opinion, uh, every city has a different journey to achieving smart city objectives, and uh, depending on the city's objectives, blockchain plays a role. Dubai obviously is, is a very structured city. Uh, they're taking the next leap into automation and customer experience and happiness through blockchain. Uh, there are countries and cities in the world whose problems are very different. Uh, they have problems of tax evasion. They have problems of verifying the validity of education certificates. They have huge issues in land records where multiple people claim the same ownership, uh, ownership of the same piece of land. Um, so there's no one size fit all. Uh, every city will have to carve its journey and then apply blockchain. Um, what is relatively proven is that blockchain does play a very vital role uh, when it comes to addressing areas of trust and transparency. Trust and transparency. We've got identification, trust and transparency. Leanne. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name's Leanne. I'm the founder and CEO of Everledger. We began in 2015 and we looked at applying blockchain to bring transparency to commodity supply chains. We began in the diamond industry. We look at tracking diamonds from the source of the mine to the market. But more importantly, when you really think about the construct of cities and people that live within it, it's very clear that trade is the beating heart upon which families and communities can build prosperity and wealth. And Dubai is a prime example um, of that construct. It was only a short 15 years ago where it made a very clear decision that it would become one of the central beating hearts of the diamond industry for commodities trade, particularly here in the DMCC, 
we wind forward to today, and Dubai is the third largest trading hub in the world for diamonds, and that was in a short construct of 15 years. What it's achieved in 15 years, Antwerp took 500 years to build. And so when we start to think about what we can bring in terms of transparency, trust, reliability, identity, and building an ecosystem of trade, that has a huge impact on actually every single one of us within the room. And so we focus that technology towards not only bringing transparency across supply chains, but how can we imagine prosperity for those within the ecosystem to build generational trust and generational businesses? David Kravitz uh, from uh, VP Crypto System, research at uh, Dark Matter. The, uh, the uh, Dark Matter is an across-the-board cybersecurity company, but my, what my team is focusing on is, is uh, blockchain in general, but more particularly, how can we have a platform that is actually scalable and uh, efficient enough to be able to handle the, the Internet of Things? And when I say that, it's not just the things themselves, but the things interacting with, with people. Uh, and uh, that can have advantages, uh, for example, in, uh, I think of it as moving anomaly detection to the, to the edge of the network so that where you are when uh, and what devices you use, that, that can be corroborated by all the devices. Uh, and that, all that might sound scary from a privacy point of view, but the kind of mechanisms that we've designed give you that that security and that auditability and that trust at the same time as controlling who or what gets to see what about you. Uh, we have you know, a lot of cryptographic mechanisms and I've been doing cryptography for several decades now. Uh, and so uh, we need to use so-called permission blockchains to make this work because I don't want my toaster to update the firmware on my pacemaker. Uh, and so the trust is not just a question of the privacy, but the integrity and trusting the source of data, especially in an automated environments where sensors take in data and then how they actuate or if they actuate depends on, on uh, whether, whether they should and how, how they should do that. Because I guess several years ago now when uh, Dick Cheney was Vice President of the United States, uh, the concern was that uh, you know, his, he could have a heart attack induced by, by, by an enemy uh, because of you know, calibrating uh, based on, on, false, uh, on false data. Uh, and so we, we deploy permissions uh, blockchains, but also interact with permissions blockchains. So we can pay for transactions, for example, using a cryptocurrency, but the, the parts that need to be permissioned, uh, we handle that uh, separately and associate those different transactions. David, if, if I understand you, if we're going to have a smart city, we need to make sure that our, our Internet of Things uh, if, that they're operating properly, that, that our, our toaster does not become the source of uh, an incursion by bad actors. Is that, is that what you're, you're well, saying? So it, it's okay, okay, if your toaster becomes an incursion by bad actors, as long as the toaster can only talk in his low trust environment, only tell the toasters or, the, or, <laughs> the to, your, or, or to your refrigerator. Yeah. But uh, because, you know, people probably are not going to die based on that. So. People like to say that devices that you connect everything with the Internet of Things, and, you know, and everything's going to be in walls, there's going to be sensors and all, you know, so people say now, like, they can't track how many devices they have. Well, that's going to become impossible in the future where there's be devices embedded in, in everything. Uh, but uh, so it's okay if everything can talk to everything as long as you know what, to, what you're willing to, to release to, to that other device or person and also whether or not you should take action, whether or not the source is trustworthy based on w w uh, what, the, what the topic is. And it's all, on the, and it's all writing on the, on the blockchain? On the well, that, that's interesting you, you, you asked that because uh, we can't do everything purely in this sort of theoretical computer science framework of, of smart contracts. We, when the IV uh, with telemedicine, when the IV is, is, is pumping medication into the patient or you're doing surgery remotely, there's obviously things that can't happen on the blockchain, but you need to set up and record on the on the uh, immutable blockchain, what that is to, to deal with, so to, to to do better with things like malpractice and you know, and, and that's where all the authorization beyond what we think of as identity management, we also need this attribute or authorization management. Uh, so that, for example, your doctor can't say, "Well, I had a bad day yesterday and I operated on the, on the left side instead of the right side of that person. Let me 
cover my tracks. So it's fine if they're authorized to enter their prescriptions or enter their data, but they shouldn't be authorized to, 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 to modify history. Thank, thanks so much, David. I, I'd like to follow up, Leanne. Um, you, we're talking a little bit about ecosystem and community. And I was wondering, maybe you could talk a little bit more how blockchain actually enables the ecosystem to evolve and how you're making that happen here in Dubai and around the world. So I think it's interesting. I mean, history has already been written. And it's very clear that a lot of organizations in the world rely upon a siloed set of decision-making constructs around siloed data. And when you are able to bring together an ecosystem of trust beyond the identity of people, but bring it to a level of the identity of objects, interesting things start to occur. We can, of course, um, reduce fraud through bad actors or bad trade practices. We can bake within industry governance real time and regulation real time, rather than being a post audit event, really thinking about what happened historically, bringing those rule sets within a shared network to enable that governance to be aligned with the benefits of industry at large and even governments. And Dubai is an example with and, its and new you, tax regime. You government, governance, you're talking real time because it's hardwired hard into the smart contract. Is that, is that what you're? Yeah, absolutely. And it's aligned to the paper process of law. So the convergence of what's been written, whether that be within sort of standards frameworks, can all be built with inside of the network complex um, systems. And so therefore, it is a law within the construct of the, of the network itself. Thank you, Leanne. I'd like to turn back over to Issa. Um, you, you, you've been working on the city project and, and reducing friction as people go about the city. And I, I suspect that is going to play a big role. Um, so what I'd, I'd like to ask if, if you can project out to blockchain and how blockchain you can see blockchain improving our societies even further. Take what you're doing and, and move it out into the future if, if you can. I'd like to step back a little bit, Leanne, about uh, for the last two days we've been hearing about blockchain. And at the end of each session we hear that we should think about the citizens. From our approach, the citizens come first. And in every problem we solve across the city is how can we help citizens have a better experience, secure, seamless, efficient. Just I want to reiterate that so that I can ask, answer your question. But to touch also on the identity, again, all transactions are done by people. And if people are doing the transaction, I need to know who they are in business and travels and logistics, etc. Now, a uh, few words on, on identity. Identity, I'm sure David can tune in, but identity is, is a multi-layered, uh, fa faceted uh, environment where it constitutes of three, uh, three main layers. One is your inherent environment. It's not intrinsic. Uh, you uh, are born with that face, with this iris, etc. Second is what you are assigned to, assigned attributes, where the government give you a driving license that you cannot change the number because that's what you're given. These things change over time, not as often as the third element, which are the attributed, uh, uh, accumulated uh, identity uh, elements, such as your health history, your uh, transaction with your colleagues at work, etc. These things, or uh, your credit scoring, your reputational scoring, these things that you accumulate ac across time, and they change quite often. So anybody who wants to tackle the problem of identity have to think about these three layers together. And we're one of the few across the world who, who does that. But more importantly, um, talking about blockchain forever does not help us really solve the use cases. So we need to start thinking about the use cases. And where does blockchain take us instead of the opposite? And that's what my, my, my view about the event for the last two days. Now, a few years from now, we will see convergence of technologies. Um, in our approach, we have a very strong facial technology based on AI. So I see blockchain and AI merging together or converging together. Um, uh, we, we will see a lot of improvement in our experiences based on that convergence, such as how we minimize fraud, such, such as how we give better experiences to, to human beings, how we get a better fintech services across the city, how can I track my, my uh, uh, pacemakers uh, if I'm in an event and uh, my insurance company or 
911 has to interfere to solve the problem. So this is where I see the technology is, uh, is going. Thank you, Isa. Bacchus, can you tell us a little bit more about where you'd like to take your, your use case and, and how you see that fitting into the society, the smart city of the future? Um, so yeah, this particular uh, use case that we're doing is uh, around reconciliation and settlement of funds, uh, which is a, a global problem. It might, might not uh, affect residents as much or citizens as much, but it does affect the efficiency of organizations that are serving these citizens and customers. Uh, so it is a global problem where different entities, A, it has to be a multi-entity use case. Uh, most of my discussions with customers and partners uh, for the past 12 to 18 months end up uh, in me telling them this is not a blockchain use case. There are better ways of doing it. Uh, but in case of reconciliation and settlement, uh, there are entities who spend number of man days wasted on matching books, um, whether they're government entities, whether they're central banks, whether they're country switches, likes of Visa and Master. Uh, the inherent concept of second eye, for which reconciliation routines have been written, is addressed by blockchain inherently, uh, because unless there's consensus on a transaction, it doesn't go through. And then we obviously use smart contracts to, for the movement of funds uh, to different entities. So we really want to take this particular use case to regulators, to people who are connected with different entities and banks and uh, government service providers uh, and help them eliminate this wastage and friction uh, that is currently uh, used by, because of reconciliation. What kind of obstacles do you foresee um, getting in the way as we try to move towards the smart city, especially in this particular instance? Oh, I could go on on this for, for a while. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are the top three? All right. Uh, number one, <clears throat> in my personal opinion, I might be wrong, uh, based on my experience, uh, it will have to be the regulator that takes a lead role. And this is why you see Dubai shine on the world map when it comes to blockchain. Um, competitors will not sit across the table to solve a problem. Uh, the payment use cases or the banking use cases that we've seen, uh, who've seen the light of day in our part of the world, are remittances. That's because a bank in UAE is achieved or solved this problem with a bank, for example, in India, because they're not competitors. Uh, I've still yet to see a use case in which two banks in UAE <clears throat> have sat down and, and tried to solve a problem on use case. So it's the regulator that will have to lead this. And in countries and uh, governments where the regulator is not playing this role, uh, the adoption will take a while. Uh, I don't see comparators sitting across the table. The other challenges, and they're more implementation cha challenges, uh, when we get involved in a blockchain project, uh, most of these projects are 30% or 40% blockchain. The other surface area of the project or solution is normal software development with normal software development challenges. Uh, because when you address a problem, there are certain areas that you clean and automate with blockchain, but then you've transformed the process along the way, and then you need to apply the tools and technologies which are conventional. So, and this is my advice to blockchain startups. They need to build expertise or gain expertise uh, by hiring the right people who have the skill of delivering full-blown citywide project implementations. The whole solution. The whole solution. And because blockchain is 20 to 30% of that solution. The other challenge that we face is, these are normally multi-entity projects. And multi-entity projects, in our case, there are 60 entities that are coming on board, a dozen banks and 40 government entities. These projects do not go live with a big bang approach. Not all 60 entities are going to come on board on day one because it's going to be a major catastrophe, which nobody can probably handle. So these projects transition into a full-blown blockchain implementation. And that approach has its own risks because end users do not want to use two systems. So in our implementations, we have to implement modules and functionalities and automation that will eventually be scrapped. But it is necessary for that's the transition. The happen. Yeah, that, 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 that's the transition that needs to take place. So I think I'm, I'm going, we're getting down into a lot of implementation no, that's good. details, no, that's good. but I think these that's are really helpful. challenges. Yeah. We, want to, you know, we want to present the ideas, but also provide a little bit more behind it. And I'm going to ask, first I'm going to um, ask Leanne, and then I'm going to go to David. Um, if you could project out where you are now and where you want to, where you want to go, Leanne, and how you think that will impact the world. Let's just say the world. I know, you've, you, I know you dream big. I do. 
So tell us a little so, more. I mean, there's a couple of things. Um, someone within the diamond industry asked me, what do you think is going to be one of the biggest impacts um, of this technology in our world? And sure, it's already delivering transparency across the supply chain, and it's enabling that story of provenance to be told for retailers and consumers so that they can answer the question, where does my diamond come from? And, and I understand the source of that. But our industry has, in the diamond industry, you know, being 500 years in the making, has a gentleman's handshake, a chit of paper, and a promise to pay. And, and we've constructed bourses and exchanges for these trading floors to occur. And I was just in India last week, and there are thousands and thousands of people standing around enabling in true peer-to-peer -peer exchange. Yet, it's within the construct of a large bricks and mortar environment with intermediaries. And I truly believe that that will completely change the way our industry trades diamonds. If we can bring together the identity of the diamond, merge that together with IoT enablement and smarter sensors or even machine vision, then the ability to trust the object that you're purchasing through the click of a button and even an iPhone and enable that to... So they'll be reading, because Correct. the iPhone will be reading the unique identifier on the diamond, just yeah. so that everyone realizes. And we're that. getting there. This is no different to the identity of people. When you think about the construct of how you identify me, you know me by my name, you associate my name with my face, but there are other parts of my forensic view that are only privileged to my dentist or my doctor <laughs> or the DNA that I hold within the hair follicle. <laughs> now, this forensic view of objects is now becoming available in the hands of consumers. And once that technology is able to be converged together, the identity of people and objects become one. That in actually changes the way we trade globally. It's hugely fascinating what that might mean. It brings the power back to those that have not only a passion for industry, but the tools are in their hand to be able to trade in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And then this becomes a model for other industry. Correct, but what's more important in all of that is to think back now, when we understand decades have passed, what have we done as humans to our own world? And have a consciousness around what it is that we're purchasing, where these items have come from, but more importantly, what is the footprint it has left across the supply chain, either the footprint of damage or the footprint of good. And so I think we should be elevating to an ethical trade platform really start to question certain supply chains in the world, whether that be lithium and cobalt and what's happening in the space with stored energy and batteries, which will be one of the largest supply chains in the world, what's happening in the space of diamonds and coloured gemstones. So this is the big question that I would like to solve. I'd like to have a conscious supply chain where really, instead of the promise of the brand is just embedded within a great marketing slogan, prove it. Prove it empirically with the data that you're able to share across the construct of that supply chain. And then I think we've done something proud. I agree. And, and you know, here in Dubai, I, I think one of the um, aspirations is that this is the happiest place, right? Yeah. This is about happiness. And it sounds like what you're doing here is really an, an important um, and happiness, aspect. And happiness needs to come with integrity, which you is can't about... You can have one without the other. Yeah, being pride. David, I would like you to, um, if, if, you, if you don't mind, you're, you're talking about um, the importance of security, integrity of data. That's right. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the, uh, the problems you foresee and how you, what, what you're thinking at and what you're looking at at dark matter, how you're going to or you right. would imagine that you'll be protecting against those problems and, and projecting out into the future, the, the smart city. Right. So one of the, one of the problems is that what, whether... When people talk about IoT, they talk about the, the IoT without differentiating, as I mentioned before, there are some things that, that really matter, like you know, the Dubai Happiness Index. Well, one aspect of happiness, I guess, is staying alive. And so to separate out, to prioritize, let them get ahead of the pack, to separate out transactions where somebody's going to die because they're sick and they, they, they need the, the ambulance. And uh, so, to, to separate th those transactions that, that matter for certain purposes, but also as the world gets more interconnected, we can take advantage of blockchain to have these checks and balances and 
reputation aspects that we're, that we're looking at, reputation of devices and users. And so, for example, it shouldn't happen that one, what happened the other day, that one person apparently messed up and Hawaii thought that they were under attack of a ballistic missile. I, I mean, it, it, if you have the, the correct analytics and reputation systems in place using blockchain, you should be able to instantaneously tell that this, is, that this, this just doesn't match. David, what, what David tell us there. why does blockchain matter here? Why is, why, how is blockchain going to fix this problem? Because, because what blockchain can do is unlike these databases hidden away that only certain people or organizations have access, blockchain can be done in a way uh, through this hierarchy that that say everyone in the world can see certain, as certain aspects of maybe all transactions. Other things, they have a need to know whether they could dig deeper, but, but uh, it's you know, getting away from the whole siloed, you know, siloed way of, of, of doing things. Uh, blockchain can, can, yeah, I mean, it's not gonna happen tomorrow. <laughs> but the but, idea is the information yeah. is on the blockchain with certain, certain people have certain permissions and because once it, it goes there, right. it can't be changed. So you and, know. and the other thing is it moves away so that you know how to get to the data. Data might be encrypted, but you could instantaneously give someone or some device the keys to, to unlock what they, you know, what they need to, exactly what they need to unlock without having to, to worry about shipping over data to them and, the, and, and, uh, and so that instantaneous aspects, because people talk about smart cities, but we're gonna have to broaden our vision beyond that. Like I was at a, a workshop recently where they talked about a particular city handling the traffic patterns so the ambulances you know, can, 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 can be routed. Uh, but what happens if that ambulance, you know, I asked, well, what happens if that ambulance is outside of the boundary of the city? So we're and, not just talking about yeah. smart cities, we're really yeah. talking about smart states, smart societies, smart That's countries. Right. Even digital trade channels internationally. Please. Know, strengthening the relationship between countries across border on the digital trade channel is also very important to the healthiness of cities internationally. Um, so the blockchain is going to be, I think of the blockchain will become the backbone. I think it's going to be, a, a it's disappointing. Backbone. I actually think in three years time or even five years time, we won't be talking about the blockchain. It will become ubiquitous. It will become something that sits as a construct that's sitting behind that's right. the use of the tools. The companies that can solve a real problem and to be focused on the user experience of this tooling is penultimately the company that will you know, bring blockchain to the masses. Um, so just like in the very early evolution of the internet, everyone was talking about the construct of a browser, you know, yes. this internet browser and www and HTTP, the hypertext. But now, of course, that is just physically a construct of the use of the internet. And of course, I think this is what's going to evolve in the blockchain. It will become one of the most transformative technologies of our time, but it will disappear in terms into the of- background. Into the background. And we'll be focusing on just how we go about our life yeah. and how we pay for things and it will be with less friction. So my, my next question to everybody was going to be, we're here in 20 years, what are we talking about? I mean, we, uh, we at my city, we watch a lot of sci-fi movies so that we come up with our ideas. But truly, if you look at many movies who are today, Star Wars, etc., there are no, the other day somebody mentioned there are no phones at anybody's hand at Star Wars. It's true, so our view is that the customer experience will prevail any technology that come forward. Yes, we need to ensure the security of it, we need to come up with creative use cases, etc. but it's all about the citizen value across everything we do or everything we innovate in. Um, let me give you an example. So uh, we, in our case, uh, we're working on some projects where you come into a service center and an avatar pops up and tell you good morning Tatiana What can I do for you today? Or uh, we worked on, on a project for the airport where you pass and you don't need to Pull any document from your pocket just virtually stamp because it recognizes your, it your face your and your face is connected to the data And it's secure because it, they've done it right <laughs> That's now, right. Now, definitely blockchain adds an element of security. There are always challenges and benefits of any technology that comes to the market, but we need to, to work with dark matter or any other institution on securing the, uh, the additional 
elements of the threats that might come, whether availability or authentication, et cetera. But I guess we need to also have fun of what we're doing. Where does this technology take us to have a better life? And that's what we always need to think when we innovate. Thank you. Please. Uh, yeah, so uh, in, in terms of technology, uh, there are technologies that are nice to have. And then there are technologies that actually help mankind achieve, you know, better ways of life. Uh, so I, I really don't, uh, even though I'm a technology person, I really don't mind if I'm greeted by an avatar or, or a smiling person in an office because that's a, that's a nice to have technology. So the whole drive around AI, it will increase efficiency and it will bring a lot of value, probably reduce costs as well. These technologies should be around. Uh, I have nothing against autonomous cars, but I don't think that's mankind's biggest need right now. It will solve a lot of problems. It will add efficiency to economies. Blockchain, on the other hand, has the power to, if not eliminate, reduce the bad in the world uh, because of its notion of transparency and trust. Uh, people shouldn't be able to hide behind data. Uh, people shouldn't be able to manipulate data. Um, th th there's a lot of... Uh, corruption and, and fakeness that, that can be eliminated. So the impact of blockchain, if adopted properly, of course, is, is more far-reaching than the other technologies that I see, including IoT and AI. Because it, it truly has that potential, because that's the notion behind it. You know, it, it it's supposed to uh, eliminate the bad. So, so over the next 20 years, I hope blockchain is adopted in the spirit in, in which it was introduced, and then create some good for the mankind in general. Um, thank you so much, Leanne. Okay. You, 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 you got started on the diamond registry because you saw a problem and you pursued it with a passion. Yeah. Um, how do you think we, uh, we create that same kind of energy and passion to drive the other types of activities that, that need to take place so that we get to where we want to be in 20 years? So I think, I mean, naturally, I'm a passionate person, but beyond the passion, there were very real challenges within industry that were coming together at a particular point in time. And so there was a desire and a need to address those because it was largely recognized that the existence of procedures and policies and people and even organizations cannot solve the problem of today from the same methodologies that were applied yesterday. And with the evolution of technology and these things being brought together, we can solve challenges that are difficult to achieve right now. So when I imagine what's going to happen in the next 20 years, and so I don't know how we, how we put that same passion into other people other than really trying to understand is there a great big challenge to be solved that is impactful, it has a purpose, and what does this purpose mean? I think in 20 years' time, Objects will have passports rather than just people. And not only that, when you think about some of the most precious supply chains we have in the world, it's about preserving Mother's Earth's assets, whether that be cobalt and lithium, whether that be diamonds and coloured gemstones. I think that once we have the constructs of these networks in place, we're going to see a true enablement of circular economies. And it was only in this month that we've now seen e-waste from Dell computing um, enabled an entire make of a, of a jewellery piece. So from the gold that's being extracted from dumping e-waste of computers and telephones, we are now able to take that extraction and put that into something of meaning and converge that into a whole new piece. And I think that's a very interesting part of the world, to really imagine what that might mean. When you think about mica, mica is mined. It is an ingredient of both paint and lipstick. No one would have imagined that. Diamonds, of course, have both synthetic and natural, and now we're seeing those being used in medical devices, in supercomputers. Now, who would have thought that the supply chain, the tree of these Mother's Earth assets, yes, they can be used in various forms, but actually what's more important is for large organisations to have a consciousness of mind around their supply chain, to actively seek out materials that are sitting in dumping waste in Nigeria. And so with the blockchain, that enables that? Of course, it enables it through provenance. Through provenance, we know. David, you're shaking your head. Do you have uh, anything to add? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm thinking that sort of a long time ago when there was all human interaction and there wasn't a fear that, that 
uh, can instantly have this replication of disastrous results because of bad actors, uh, whether it's financial or, or, or worse results. Uh, and then, you know, people walking around on smartphones, walking into things and not communicating with one another anymore. Uh, so, ideally, we can have through block blockchain, as it does become this sort of hidden plumbing that we talked about, and we can we can move back and some move backwards in some sense, to, because so a lot of the trite, a lot of the trite stuff, a lot of the stuff that now we get overwhelmed with, with the emails and all that. that so we, we go back in some sense at the same time of taking taking advantage of all the technology, but it just becomes more. David, more I sense. think that's really a point well taken. That. Um, so many of us are so involved with social media and all of the new functionality with our phones and our laptops that um, sometimes we lose some of the human interaction. Right. So perhaps as the technology takes a back seat and goes um, perhaps underground, we can begin to make sure that we're associating with each other uh, more directly. Right. And, and, and that will also add to the happy, happiness <laughs> exactly. quotient, right? Because that's, right. that's so that's important right. as well. Oh, we have a little time. Does, before we go to questions, do any of my panelists have any further comments they'd like to? Isa, do you have something? Um, I guess, uh, elaborating on what you just said with David, uh, we are all heterogeneous in, in nature. And each one of us brings a different value to what we do uh, today, whether we're an enterprise or a person, etc. But my view on things is, there will always be a value, like what, what Leon was mentioning, it's scary if, if every now device, or sorry, jewelry will have a passport. I mean, it's better for us because we can also use facial technology to recognize you even more, but it's, it's going to get scarier. So how does disruption avoid people to be scary? And that's what we need to think about. And we can spend another session on disruption. Um, but disruption can get scary if, if we don't really manage it well. But, but it's disruption for good. Right. Correct. It's for value, it's for trust, for it's trust, for truth. Yeah. I'd, I'd just like to add that the, the, these are exciting times. I, I remember back in, not back in, but just last year, uh, I attended, I think, uh, around 10 blockchain conferences, and they would start uh, with a two-hour session on blockchain 101. What is blockchain? What does it do? And uh, it's good to see that this conference did not start with that kind of a presentation. We jumped right into use cases, and we're talking about projects. Uh, James spoke about the Walmart case study. Uh, that, that are actually seeing the light of day in, in a much broader scope. So this gives a lot of hope and a lot of, brings a lot of excitement to people like us, you know, that this is a new technology that is now making inroads. And hopefully by end of 2018, we'll see much more bigger projects. Some, some, some will fail, some will succeed, but the journey is, is amazing. So Got to be on the journey. Got to be, be on the journey. Um, I'm opening the floor to questions. Thank you for the note on that the blockchain technology implementation will not be something that we jump onto it radically over a day. And about 40% is what you quoted as a parallel run between the legacy systems or the, the digital systems as well as the blockchain implementations. My question is exactly on how do you decide on the maturity model? Who will be in the first phase and the second and so on and so forth into integration based on the blockchain? The maturity model of the systems when it comes to multiplayer integrations. Well, because she's looking at yeah, you. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, it will vary from project to project and use case to use case. Um, I can give you an answer by giving you an example of, of the project that we are doing. So, for example, today Department of Finance uh, reconciles a lot of funds, government funds. Uh, they process a lot of disputes and they process a lot of refunds. Uh, so, they have a full-blown team that looks after all these finance functions. We are solving the reconciliation piece, which means the matching of books between 40 government entities and 15 banks and Department of Finance. This process is being eliminated uh, because through blockchain we are providing that second eye concept which inherently removes a reconciliation routine. But in doing so, we are also cleaning up a lot of the other inefficiencies or frictions in their systems in terms of what happens when a dispute is claimed by a government entity, what happens when a bank claims a refund. So all these areas in our context is, is being, is being opt opt optimized or automated. So 
in, in this context, I said blockchain is 30%. The remaining is automation and optimization of existing processes. Now, based on the projects that you are engaged in, you, you'll have to come up with, with this breakup or, or with this maturity model that what is the need of the project. Uh, but these are the kind of examples I can give. I, I can't tell you exactly. I mean, there's no formula to that. As this gets better and better, more and more parties and types of things get disintermediated. Uh, and not, not even to mention the criminal elements that make it harder to get away with what, with what they're doing now. And so, you know, back when we talk about AI and IoT and all, there's all this, this question about people losing, losing their jobs and what happened. You know, and so that can, that can all uh, get exponentially compounded if we combined IoT and AI machine learning with blockchain. With, with blockchain. And so, so as, as often happens, is, is aspects of society like the, the legal prof profession and the pol politics is, and even medicine, whatever, is far behind the technology, or the way physicians think, is far behind the technology. This is something that I think we're gonna have to prepare ourselves for, for re-educating and, and society still becoming productive and happy, even if they don't have the jobs that well, they different have. jobs, right? Yes. So we, we create efficiencies, we create new processes, we create new value, we create whole new industries based on blockchain, things that we haven't even exactly. thought of. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's like we talked about, when there were new things that happened, we have a little anxiety and we move on and we evolve. But, um, but it's exciting. So, okay, from the panel, we thank you. Thank you so much, audience. <laughs>